Almighty Father in heaven, in the name of your Son, our glorious and victorious Savior, Jesus Christ, we humbly ask for your blessing upon our worship of you on this, your holy and sanctified Sabbath day, so that we may grow more in our knowledge of you, our love for you, and our obedience to you. Neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies which minister questions rather than godly edifying which is in faith. So do. Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned, from which some, having swerved, have turned aside into vain jangling, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. But we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully. Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men-stealers, for liars, for perjured persons, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. Amen. We are living in a time that I find absolutely amazing to, in a way, and to a degree that I never thought I would see, because I have always looked at the end time, and I'm not saying we're in it, but I'm, I think we're closer today than we were yesterday. Is that would that be safe to say? But as we're getting towards something that we know is coming, if you believe in prophecy, we're seeing all sorts of strange things happen in this world. Things that the Pope came out with yesterday that he claims now, or he believes now, uh, that Jesus Christ was metaphorical, not literal. He's saying, he, in effect, and in doing so, he's actually fulfilled a prophecy about the Antichrist, in that how denying that Jesus came in the flesh, the very well-known prophecy, I'll put the link on for that, and how he's saying, and they, and then they said originally, at first that it was taken out of context, but then others who read exactly or listened to what he said, he meant exactly what he said, and he's not backing off from it. And now a few hours later, I've actually seen uh, further reports that that particular news page was fake news. And but again, it, it goes with whether that particular one or was was or not. He is a liberal, the most liberal pope that they've had in ever, if not the last thousand years. But certainly, one of the most liberal popes there are. And ironically, you know, the fake news thing is so um, bizarre. I, I guess I'm sort of naive when I put that on because here in this country, fake news is against the law. You can actually have we have the CRTC, which is like the governing body of radio and television. I guess they haven't quite caught up the Internet yet. But it's against the law, you, and you can have your license, your broadcast license, for a TV station or radio station. You can't spew lies. Whereas in other countries, under the, under the cloak of freedom of speech, it doesn't matter if it's flat-out lie or not. They can't stop you. You can probably get sued or something, but... They say it anyway, and so we're we're learning. We have to be more careful than that. I mentioned in our actually our Facebook page that how Satan just doesn't know when to leave things alone. But even even if that was a fake news page, it was a satanic fake news page, and either way, the, the effect is the same. But again, again, you just can't. Who do you trust? You know. And I think I actually I got that link from uh, the Drudge Report. Uh, he's been very big on the fake news. He's Mr. Anti-Fake News himself. And he apparently put it on as well and had millions of people read it, one of which was me. And so, you know, it's just an amazingness, you know, an absolute amazingness in which that happens and, and just everywhere. And we're seeing that happen in so many ways in so many places politicians who are really 
and get elected. I mean, a few years ago, even not even a generation ago, we're seeing politicians who would, wouldn't have a hope, the slightest hope of ever getting elected, wouldn't even have the audacity to run, who are actually now getting elected. And I don't mean to some local council, municipal government, or city government. I'm talking about the head of countries that are being elected right now. And they're, they're like a wrecking ball. And conservatives, they may claim to be, but they're liberals in tearing things down. Just amazing thing. The old rules don't really apply anymore. Or do they? Because if you look at what we knew or know the end result is going to be of, of all of this, it's just one thing after another. And just It's like whatever is has got to come down. It doesn't matter what it is. It's got to come down. Uh, we're seeing now a lot of the sexual harassment frenzy that's going on. Uh, I saw another one, a well-known U.S. Uh, a morning show anchor, uh, just before I've begun recording this, uh, has apparently been fired for sexual harassment. One thing I don't understand about those those accusations of those charges, if you know something happens that long ago, why didn't they go to the police or report it? You know, it, it just seems strange. It's like there's this frenzy going on now, and I'm not belittling. A crime, if a crime in fact happened, that's another matter, you know, innocent to proven guilty, but it doesn't matter either. It's like being a straight, white, English-speaking male is, you're a target now. And, you know, because straight, white, male, Anglo-Saxon males have been running a large part of the Western world uh, for a long time, that that just makes sense. It's just whatever is it's got to come down. It doesn't matter what it is. And what? how is this happening? I mean, you look around, all the things that are happening, why? What is this? And there is a common spirit, an attitude in it. It's like whatever is has got to come down. And you know, if you think about the spirit of the world such as it has become, I mean, it's a good thing it's coming down. I mean, Satan, his world is coming down. For sure, when the Messiah arrives, that's that's something I thought would, would really begin to happen. We know the end time, the destruction. But I thought a lot of the destruction would be the Lord's wrath upon it. And it is. That's going to be the finishing touch, if you will. But I never realized before seeing what's happening right now in this world, that Satan's world is doing it to itself. Satan just whether it be the Church of Rome or whether it be some of the greatest political frauds in the history of humanity, it's like Satan wasn't content. There he was. To, he's built these masterpieces of deception. And he just didn't have enough sense to leave it alone and let it do its deception. He's now actually, I, I put this on our Facebook page yesterday, Satan is actually doing a Satan on himself. It's like whatever he is, it's got to come down. And his great, magnificent... I mean, I, I saw in that article about the Pope, there were actually cardinals calling the Pope, the present Pope, the Antichrist. And it doesn't matter if that particular one is fake news or not. That is something that has been heard throughout the ages. You know, the struggle for the papacy. How sometimes they were actually two popes at the same time, sometimes even three. They'd call each other the Antichrist or anti-popes and all the thing, you know, that's a matter of history. And that's gone on for centuries, how the struggle for that office. Because, you know, when the Bishop of Rome was rising in power because he was the emperor's local bishop, the bishops throughout the empire, they didn't take that very well. Because they, they said, well, who are you? You know, what makes you so much better? And the fact is he wasn't, except he was the emperor's local bishop. And he was always secondary, and always that in Revelation 13, same thing, you read it. So, and they became like the cardinals, but that's a big demotion. I mean, they can become the emperor of Rome, but they can't become the pope of their own selves, because that's the way it began. And this idea began with Peter, please, please. That was a creation of the emperor Constantine and his mother. The whole thing, the Church of the Holy Sepulcher and all that, we see that coming up every once in a while all the shrouds and relics and, and fragments of the cross 
I mean, if you could add all those up that have been found, you probably could build a mansion from them. You know, all, all the wood that's been found, all the fake news there. I mean, that's it's not it's not new in that sense. But the thing is, you can't. The basis of a particular story, whether it rings true or not, is, is and ironically, is whether it, what you know about everything else that's been going on about it. And the, what was read in that article, whether it's true or not, it did ring ring true in the ears of many people, including me, simply because of the historic basis that everyone know. It wasn't just it didn't begin and end with one particular uh, clickbait. Uh, phony web page if that's indeed what it was but who's to say that those who say are fake news that they aren't the fake news <laughs> because you know it could be who knows they don't want to admit it I noticed Matt Drudge hasn't said anything about it and he's the one that put it on there for millions of people to read and he's Mr. Anti-Fake News as he said. but of course his view of fake news is, is his extreme conserv- so called conservatism from a political viewpoint but what he's spewing from that other side of it I mean, it's fake news, too, because it's extremely biased. You can tell the absolute truth and still be an absolute liar, simply by what you leave out. In the papacy, the public criticisms of this particular man, they didn't dare do it to Benedict. I mean, they'd be gone, but this guy, he's, he's extremely liberal. And they they say it. Again, the reason it rang so true. If it's not, in fact, true, because I think the, the jury's still out on that. You know, I think there's much more to it. It may have been a fake article, but it may also have been true. It's simply somebody faked their version of it, but it could still be true because I think it was. A lot of those people, a lot of the things that he said, if you take a listing of, of the very liberal things that this particular pope has said and done, how he doesn't judge people. I mean, no pope's ever said that. I think he, he was speaking of sodomites when he said that. You know, who is he to judge? Well. You know, the, the papacy has been claiming that it was only through him that that office, that salvation could be had. It was certainly his represent, the vicar of Christ on earth. He sits, claimed that was the very claim of it. So, you know, go back and read a lot of the things he said over his brief reign. And, you know, who knows which one's true or not. I mean, really. And, you know, they were leaving themselves open to an incredible internal situation in that they can't even retaliate because it, it isn't some so-called Protestant um, preacher coming along and, and knocking the Church of Rome. And by the way, that's been a part of the deception as well because the Protestant world is still Catholic when it comes to doctrine. They may have rejected uh, the same as Luther himself. There were many other reformers, but Luther is the classic, most well-known one. He rejected the papacy's leadership, he, when he made his famous trip to Rome and he saw the immorality, how the Vatican of that time had actually literally become a, a, a house of harlotry, he was shocked. There he was, this young, very straight-minded, well-meaning monk, and he went and he saw all this going on and he just couldn't quite handle that. But his protest wasn't against the doctrine. He kept Sunday, kept all the on the island, most of them, 95% of them, the ones he changed, he changed for his own suit, to suit himself, and all the things that went on from that. You know, even that, we're seeing now something that's, whatever it is, is coming down. And it's not a bad thing, but it, I think it requires on our part now, not an easier task in the end because it actually is going to become more dangerous but to just simply realize that it isn't a matter of them quote unquote coming after the truth because in most cases they don't really care anyway but rather to understand that this world has become so full of iniquity so toxic to itself that it's that toxicity that we must not become made sick of from. Because it's going to be so easy to be drawn into it. The mark of the beast, well, can't buy or sell and all that, but you know, a lot of people have been experiencing that 
for centuries already. Whether it be observing the Sabbath in a world that's just totally against it, or the holy days, how many people have lost their jobs in the autumn because they had to go and attend the true Christian holy days. You know, all these things, or to, to believe what the Bible actually says in this world such as it is now, is just absolutely amazing. And we're seeing politicians. Here in Canada, we've got Justin Trudeau. I mean, I thought he, I knew he was a liberal, but not as liberal, liberal, liberal as this man is, is also in itself amazing. He's been apologizing lately for things that previous governments have done. He's going to undo crimes that were committed in the past regarding moral behavior to retroactively make something legal that was at the time a crime which I don't think is itself legal. You can't make something illegal retroactively, so why can you make something legal? But he's pardoning whoever, I mean, a lot of people's speculation about Justin Trudeau in that regard. Um, you know, I, if somebody is what they are, they should admit it. Don't. I, I think it's unfair to the wife, the children, the family, and all the rest of it, and they getting going on all of that, but he never misses a gay parade across the country. Uh, he flies the gay flag all over the so-called rainbow flag, which, by the way, is an absolute insult to the very purpose of what that symbolism was given by the Lord after the flood because the Lord destroyed the very world that thought that way. You know, the iniquity. Noah, if he were com to come back today, he would be well familiar with He'd say, oh my, here it is again. Here we go again. But it's something that, you know, you don't have to, I think, I think the greatest preaching that there is will be to yourself. I don't mean hide your Christianity, but the time I think, and I've said this before, I said this years ago, that toward the end time, we know for certain during the 42 months, there aren't going to be many people called, because you still need that depth. And yes, I know about the, the parable of the workers in the vineyard and all that. But you know, that could be applying as much to an end time generation as a whole as, you know, it could be the apostles saying that, you know, we were martyred, we were, you know, beheaded, we, we did all the things that had to happen, that happened to us. Look at all the things that happened to us. And there you are at the end, living in your so called civilized countries with your rights and everything. You know, they could be saying it in that regard as well. But I think. Righteousness character, righteous character takes time. It's not something you can do on your deathbed. You, know, you can't repaint. I mean, it's better than nothing, I guess, but, you know, where's the depth? Where's the proof? And a, a confession or a repentance on a deathbed in a time of distress, what's it really worth anyway? And I'm not belittling it. I'm just saying, you know, you have to sort of walk the walk for a while. And that takes time. And I think it's not to say that there aren't going to be billions of people who are, as we know, from the later physical resurrection, that people are going to do that. And all the things that they're doing now, what's happening in the world, and that's my, that's my point B, is that it's not wasted. That in their living, the lawless, liberal iniquity that they're living, they're in fact learning that the gospel is true. They just don't know it yet. They haven't suffered enough for it yet. Because I think billions of people are going to wake up at that time of the second resurrection physically. And after they realize they have been resurrected, they're going to say, well, I sure don't want to go back to that again. The misery, the, the foolishness, the self-destructiveness, and all the things that people have done. So even what's doing right now, Satan right now is doing, don't get me wrong when I say this, but I, I used to, have at least respect his intelligence because he was God-given. But he's, he has so much perverted it that he hasn't got that anymore. We know he's lost his wisdom. Or other, otherwise, he wouldn't have been a rebel. And it's plainly stated, it was his wisdom and his beauty that went to his head. No pun intended. But he's lost his intelligence. When you have something that is working so well, for your stated goal of deceiving the world, he's then turning around now and destroying it. He's watering it down. He's actually making people realize 
that what he's created is a fraud. But again, perhaps in this end time, nobody cares. As I said, there were there are people who are serving in high offices and in various political and, and church and all sorts of organizations who wouldn't even be wouldn't have had the audacity to even run. Not even a generation ago. That's how fast it's changing now. So although it seems confusing to a lot of people, it's really a part of the plan. And it, ironically, it makes our job easier. Because you're not hurt by what other people do to themselves. And if the most they can do is kill you, even at that extreme, they haven't accomplished anything. Because you're going to be resurrected. And if you've clung and hung to the truth, you're going to be there in the first resurrection. That's your eternal life. Whereas they, later on, if they don't repent and if they aren't converted, they're going to be resurrected physically. And guess who they're going to be facing? You know, the people they killed as a physical. And again, they're going to say, well, I sure don't want to do that again. Because they sure aren't going to be able to kill you then. And if you look at all the things that have have been done and are being done, you can see the greater purpose of it. It's a giant lesson. So let them go to it. Because even so doing, if they're not going to listen, this is the next best thing. Because they're going to listen to their pain in good time. In due time. And in good time. So it isn't as though anything has changed. It's just as though we've, we've come to realize that the Lord is dealing with humans, and humans are bloody, messy, dirty, or can be creatures. And sometimes the best lesson is to simply let them do with themselves what they're lusting to do with themselves. Because the lesson there, they become their own teachers in due time as well. And, you know, if you look at the how that's being taught, the lessons when someone is warned, and they go on and do it anyway, then turn them over to Satan and let Satan do what he wants with them. To stay clear of them. doesn't mean you're somehow so so self-righteous that, oh, why aren't we so holy and this poor person I'm avoiding is, is so, so low. It's just a matter of not being dragged down with their chosen path. You know, everyone has to answer for themselves. It's an exciting time, but it's it's an amazing time, too. Nothing surprises me anymore. I can say that with complete honesty. When I turn on the news in the morning, I know it's that anything goes. I used to, I was getting kind of actually bored with news because it's the same old, same old, you know, you know. But it's not the same old, same old anymore. Because when you turn on the news in the morning, I get most of my news from the Internet. Even my news, our local newspaper, I get that on the Internet no newspaper anymore, I guess. It's like, oh boy, what have they done today? But you know the end result is going to be the kingdom of God. And if Satan wants to tear down part or even most of what he's built, it's going to be torn down by the Lord when the kingdom of God comes. Anyway, well, let him do it. That kingdom come. Beginning today then, Today is sermon number 706 overall, sermon 265 in our ongoing complete reading of the Holy Bible, the King James Translation. And the one thing about the Bible is that it is always there. It is as true now as it will be a thousand years from now, or a thousand years ago, or two thousand years ago. It is the same Word of God forever, because it is perfect. The only imperfection in the Word of God is man's inability to obey it perfectly yet. And because humanity was created physical in order to be destroyed if the choice is made. And again, as we just discussed, it's not something that the Lord wants. It is his will that everyone repent. That's what he said. It's recorded. But the thing is, we have a free choice to make. And that choice will be made upon knowledge and awareness. And you can't get that by dreaming it up or of an opinion and expecting the Lord to obey you, I don't mean you, you, but you see the point, you can't just do as you please and expect the Lord to sort of bow before you. Because, and that's the way the world is doing it right now. They believe that freedom 
their idea of freedom is to just do as you please, whereas in the Lord's, the Lord believes in freedom too, but freedom to follow the way of life, the way of life, and the way to life, or not. That's freedom. You can do as you please. And if you want to live in whatever wild and self-destructive way you want, you can do that. And you can do that before your repentance, and you can do it after. You know, the Lord isn't forcing anyone to do it. No one is going to be dragged, kicking and screaming into the kingdom of God. That situation is reserved for the lake fire, for those who refuse to repent. There are going to be no rebels, no liberals, and no so-called conservatives in the kingdom of God. Because what is actually conservatism today really isn't. It's not. Because what people are, it means to conserve. And if you're conserving error, you know, there are all sorts of conservatives. The governments of, of various regimes around the world, well, they're the conservatives now, even though some may be communists, some may be fascists, some may be capitalists, some, whatever. An anarchist could be a conservative if anarchy is the way in the established order. And that's sort of a paradox, but it's true. Conservatism of this world is simply a matter of maintaining what is. And in that sense, you know, Satan, as we said, should be a conservative. He should just leave his, his perfect, self-destructive, de super deceptive mess alone. But even he can't. He just can't sit back now and watch the destruction happen. He has to destroy his own work as well. And it just makes more and more, it makes it more difficult, but it makes it easier to really see the truth. Because the, the contrast now is just absolutely glaring between the way that works, the Word of God, and everything else. And, you know, that doesn't mean it's easier to obey, because, you know, it gets, there's so much fun going on, you know, everyone is doing it. It's the old saying, well, broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. That's what the Lord's answer to that is. And it's true. And, I, as I said before, I, I think, I've not changed my mind about many things, as a matter of what the Bible, I believe the Bible to be. But I think as time goes on and understanding deepens by study and trying to live it particularly, because just knowing it, that alone isn't doing You have to live it. Again, why time is necessary, because when you try to live something, you can. Re it's like a scientist who never leaves the laboratory. They can come up with some fantastic ideas, probably accurate. But until they go out there in the real world and really live it and, and apply it in the real world, they're not going to have the full understanding and full knowledge of what they, they know. And it's, again, the truth. Living a Christian life is much easier. And the people, you know, after the Messiah's return, uh, those who will exist at that time who won't be in the first resurrection who, and yet be physical, they aren't going to have that resurrection because their resurrection, in effect, and we don't often don't hear them talked about, is the physical world, their conversion will begin within their own physical lives at that time. And it's going to apparently go on for that thousand years, generation after generation. There's no other reason for that to be. So they will not have that sort of resurrection. The eighth day, it will, the principle will apply as much to them. But the eighth day resurrection is about all those who died prior to the Messiah's return without the knowledge that they will have otherwise at that time. And those of the first resurrection will be of those who do whether they're alive that day, or whether they lived a thousand years ago, five thousand years ago, Abraham, uh, David, all those people back then, Noah. Uh, we don't know what happened to Adam and Eve. Uh, certainly they had an applied lesson of, of what they know, how they've fallen uh, to the great height. I saw, I mentioned the, the news of, of Anchor. Imagine having a job in which you were paid $75,000 a day to be a news anchor or to, to have a talk show, morning show talk show. Because that's what that one man lost. $75,000. It was a contract. He worked that out to a weekly basis. $25 million a year. After taxes, it comes to about $75,000 a day. I mean, that's, you know, there's a lot of people don't make that in a year. And there's somebody who used to make you know, the, the fall. I mean, you could write a book on you know, what he's going to do now, but you know, you could write a book on what it's like to make $75,000 a day and then not make that. Presumably, he's got quite a bit of money 
you know, he didn't just spend it all, so he's financially he's probably set for life, but still. Uh, and then daily and all, it's just an absolutely amazing, to a mind-boggling amount. Imagine going to work for he's on air, I think, for four hours or two hours or whatever it is. He'd be paid seventy-five thousand dollars, and that's what he's thrown away in it. And others, same thing. There's a whole bunch of them actually, surprising things. But again. You know, that's, that's the way it is. Whatever it is, it is. But again, you know, I don't think he was a converted man yet, so he'll, that'll be part of his lesson package that he'll bring along with him. And as we said, the people in the, in, who will be alive, but who had never been called, uh, prior to the day of Christ's return, and yet who will be physical throughout that time. You know, you could apply the worker in the vineyard parable to them. You could be, if you're called first. You know, the people of the time of the apostles, uh, they could apply maybe it to us because while well, you live in these easier times and rights and everything, but you know the people who are going to be alive and physically converted, converted physically after the time of the Messiah, they're going to have a whole lot easier than we are, because Satan's going to be put away. Uh, the law will go forth from Zion. The people will learn the swords into plowshares, so there will be peace. No false religion. No false anything. No fake news websites. For us naive little Tweety birds to get suckered into, uh, and you know all this rest of it, you know they're going to have it pretty easy compared to what we have. So we could, you know, the parables they are very good, very good at at, at time how they apply, and I think they apply to on different levels of they can be microscopic if almost or macroscopic because they can, but you know we could say it of them. You know, imagine they're going to have a world, and why it goes on, as we said, you know, they could have children that can go on for a thousand years. Why else would it last a thousand years? That would be the point. If it was just the one generation, well, it would be the, to finish off those the lifetimes of those uh, who were not converted prior to the time of, day of Christ's return, and then the rest of their natural physical lives, and then the, the resurrection. So it would be like less than a century. They would be adults. You know, or even if infants alive that day, you know, and there's going to be some. You know, that's the only world they're going to they're going to be literally born in the kingdom of God, but not born again. They could be born on the day of Christ's return when Satan's put away, and you know, just think of, of the life they're going to have. You can say, well, you know, talking about the parable of the of the workers in the vineyard, they're never going to know Satan on the list, except at the very end, where he's going to be let loose and tested. Tested for him, I think, as much as humanity. I think it's going to be one final chance for Satan to repent. And we know what he's going to do because it's already prophesied. We're told ahead of time. But, you know, you look at all these things, and it's important to understand that. I think I've never heard, I've, I've read some of their stuff, I've listened to some of their sermons, I've never heard them mention that part of it. In that, that they're nothing, they're, they're not special as, as, as a matter of humanity. They'll be just as human as anybody else, but they're not going to be resurrected because they won't have died, and the Christ will be on earth, and yet they will not have been converted. So, what are they? They're sort of a special category. Oh well, they're just that's their time. And again, the parable, you know, the the last hour coming up, you know, they didn't have the heat of the day. Is the only thing that they're still going to have the choice to make. Again. You know, it's not going to be just a matter of the human nature that's been instilled in humanity. Uh, even though Satan's going to be put away, they're, they're still going to have to overcome that rebelliousness that seems to be ingrained in physical humanity. Because, you know, they can still make that choice. And apparently, as we read, you know, those who don't go up to observe the Feast of Tabernacles will get no rain. You know, and, and the plagues and all the rest of it. So the lessons will still be there. But, you know, if, if we can look at the world as we understand it and then live in it, because that's, that's, that's a twofold lesson. You, can, you can't just know it. You can't just hide your Christianity, true Christianity. I mean, why should you have to? No one else does. The Sunday-keeping world, they don't hide it. But, you know, you look at it the way it really is, and it gets easier, even though it gets harder. But, again, the reason it's easier is because your roots are deeper. And the Lord is then, as a 
tree grows taller, there's more of it there to catch the wind and the storms. You're not just a little twig anymore. And again, you're stronger, but actually you're up there catching more wind. You're more resistance as well. It's like a big truck. You know, it, it, it hauls much more. It's much bigger. It has much more content, but it's also catching more wind resistance. It requires more fuel and power to do what it's needed to do. But it, again, that's what we're designed to do. Sermon number 706, overall, Sermon 265, and our ongoing complete reading of the Holy Bible. And as we read this with what I just said, what we just have come to realize in our time, let's realize it's not new. As I mentioned earlier, it's something that the apostles understood. They lived it. They lived it within their own congregations when they went liberal. And it's something when you can really start to see something. It's amazing how every once in a while this will happen. You can read past something a hundred times. But only when a life experience happens that you really begin to see. It's like a light flips on. Or a, a full color light goes on. You can really see things for what they are. It's not just a one-sided view of something that really is more to it than that. And it... it Again, the, the purpose for everything that, that is the Lord's purpose. The Lord is in control. And the things that are being... Many people ask, well, why does, the, why does God allow sin? Well, I'll put the link on for that study. And it really comes down to the same reason that we're watching what we're seeing now. People will be accepted for salvation because they choose to be there, and that means freedom to make that choice. And again, why I don't believe it's something you can do on your deathbed. If you're in distress and in pain and suddenly cry out, well, I'm a Christian, or, or Lord, save me. Right? I believe in the name of Jesus. I'm not mocking people who have done that, but I'm just saying it's going to take more. And it's going to take more when they're resurrected to live that life. That's the reason for, I mean, isn't it obvious? It's the reason for that second resurrection, why it will be physical. Whereas the first one, those who have overcome and proved their, their worth to themselves as true Christians will not be resurrected physical but the spirit because now for them throughout their human lifetimes until that time until the day of Christ's return that's their judgment day whereas those resurrected physical later on as portrayed and prophesied by the eighth day of the Feast of Tabernacles but link on for that they will have lived their lives and you can see it's not I mean it's obvious I mean how can it be because somebody who claims to be become a Christian on their deathbed, well, it's not, first of all, at the instant of their death, they're going to be alive again physically, and they're going to have to do something. And it's going to go on from that, isn't it? I mean, is is the answer to that, is that just not totally plain? It's the reason there is a second answer. But we know these two people are going to be in the first one. Saul, who later became the Apostle Paul, and Stephen. And notice here, when we first read of Saul, he's taking part in the killing of Stephen. And Paul, after he became Paul, Saul, after he became Paul, deeply regretted that. He lived with it for the rest of his life. And he, ex he explained it and referred to it in other epistles. Put the link on for that. There's no getting away with anything. But it's something that made him, again, a deeper Christian in that he knew it was wrong, finally, and he would never want to go back and do it again. In his case, better to take it. And ironically, what happened to Stephen and eventually happened to Paul himself. I don't think Paul was stoned, but he was killed one way or the other. Acts chapter 8, verse 1, beginning today, And Saul was consenting unto his death, and at that time there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Now, consider a very different time. It was a very conservative law and order time. Yes, the Romans occupied the country, but the, the signs of that were happening. I'm, I'm sure the, the zealots were already the, the mention of them. Uh, the knife, the dagger guys... I'm sure the assassinations had started whenever they had the opportunity to do it. Eventually they would continue on, but it was a very conservative time. It wasn't a lawless time. 
It wasn't lawless in, in the matter of how the people of Judea, of Judah, were living, and it wasn't lawless in the terms of the Roman occupation. It wasn't the world now. By a long shot. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hailing men and women, committed them to prison. Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. And you'll notice there how it backfired again. Satan's little persecuting Christians, martyring Christians, chased them out of town. And all that really did was cause the gospel to spread in literally in every direction. So again, Satan, how he does things backwards. He's really good at that. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And the people, with one accord, gave heed unto those things. And the people, with one accord, gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits, crying with a loud voice, came out of the many, out of many, that were possessed with them, and many taken with palsies that were lame were healed. And there was great joy in that city. So again, see what happened? They drove the, mother, the Christians out of Jerusalem, and look what happened. The gospel benefited from it. And there, But there was a certain man named Simon, which before time in the same city used sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that himself was some great one. So the same old story, my aren't I wonderful, they said. To whom they all gave heed from the, last, from the least to the greatest, saying, this man is the great power of God. So again, every misleader needs a following. Or else, by definition, again, he's not a misleader. And the really good ones are those who tell people what they want to hear. Customer is always right, Christianity, as I've started to call it. And uh, actually, I've been calling it that for some time, but I used a different term for it. And to him, they had regard because that of a long time he had bewitched them with sorceries. And when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Then Simon himself believed also, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. Again, oh, that's a good start. He repented. But again, imagine if it was just a one-day thing, again, to make the point. Oh, there's a necessary time of growth and proving, testing, character building, because look what happened. He was on, he was right on there that day of his so-called repentance, but now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who, when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And again, important point there, I'll link on that study. And the he there, of course, is a, the result of Greek language structure. Uh, the actual word in English would be it, but they translated it as he. And the translators knew very well that it was it, that into English we don't have that same um, grammatical usage. Uh, French is another language that uses it. Um, but they translated it literally to their minds, but it wasn't really literal because if they would have translated it literally, it would be it, not he. It is the Holy Spirit of God. It is not a God or a member of a trinity or all the rest of that. To look under them. Then laid they their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. And when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money. So there you go. What was he looking for? Verse 19 saying, Give me also this power, that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. 
But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. So where was his heart? While he was still the carnival huckster, he repented for a very brief time, apparently, and who knows, he might have. He might have genuinely repented, but the thing is he hadn't yet grown the roots of character, the depth of character, to really be able to hold on, to withstand the tests that will surely come. And there was one. He was impressed with the power that he witnessed from Peter and John. So therefore he reverted to his old self. So he didn't have it, did he? And there again is the reason. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. And again, how would they have known that if they had just gone by what he had done the first day? Because the first day they might have very well said, Thy heart is right with God. And who knows that it wasn't? Because he repented he went and was baptized, apparently, sincerely, but he wasn't tested yet. Repent therefore of this, thy wickedness, and pray God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. So again, even if you mess up, if you repent again, you'll be forgiven. For I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness, and in the bond of iniquity. Then answered Simon and said, Pray ye to the Lord for me, that none of these things which ye have spoken come unto me. Well, there's a good point again. There you go. Did he hold on? Well, there are, are a number of theories. Uh, some people believe that he became the first Pope, Simon, and so on. I think the Armstrong tradition of churches believe that. There is some supposed uh, documentation that he had done that. Uh, no solid proof, but it's, it's speculation. Maybe. Who knows? Uh, or he could have stayed the course from then on. Who knows? We'll know in due time, but if we had to know everything now, we would. It's none of our business. And they, when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, returned to Jerusalem and preached the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. And ironically, Samaritan, Samaria, up there was once the land of the northern ten tribes in the northern kingdom of Israel uh, who were taken away became the lost ten tribes and the Babylonians uh, or Assyrians brought in the people from Babylon uh, to settle the land so it wouldn't just go completely wild again and eventually when the people of Judah returned they began calling those people who were living in Samaria the Babylonians who were living in Samaria Samaritans that's the reason they were held in with contempt, it wasn't just a matter of north and south situation of the kingdom, but rather they were foreigners. Or sort of, because they were, actually came from where Abraham came from, Babylon. It's where man was created. Humanity was created. It's where Noah lived. It's where Abraham was born. Verse 26, And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south, unto the way which goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. And he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority, under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure, and had come to Jerusalem for her to worship. And this, again, Ethiopian, African um, nation, uh, Moses married an Ethiopian. He was criticized for it by Aaron and Miriam, um, both of which learned a lesson not to do that. I'll put a link on for that. But again, you know, it, it's something that people ignore of the Ephraim and Matt, the Anglo-Israelism idea, theory, which I think has merit, at least in the sense that we know they do exist out there and they're going to be gathered. There is no doubt they exist and that they could very well be uh, scattered through all nations while at the same time having their own nation. The people of Judah have proven that one. The Jews practically every country on earth, and yet they have their own country. They should have called it Judah, though, uh, not Israel, because it is really a restoration of the kingdom of Judah, not the kingdom 
of all of, of the United Kingdom of Israel. That's not going to happen until the Messiah returns, the gathering. But it's something that they ignore the fact that the mother of Ephraim and Manasseh was an Egyptian woman uh, in the land of Ham, and the original Egyptians were black people. I mean, it's the, it was their, their region. And, you know, it's the reason. I'm surprised, though, that, that they criticized uh, Moses for marrying an Ethiopian. But the thing is, there could be a, a bit of a tribal factor in that as well, because no, Moses, Moses was a Levite. And the descendants of of Ephraim and Manasseh, they are the ones with the Egyptian mother. But again, over 400 years, if you think they weren't intermarrying during all that time, uh, you know, what planet are you living on? But it, it's a connection that a lot of people in the Anglo-Israelism thing, I've never heard them mention it. Never. When in fact, you know, uh, Ephraim and Manasseh probably looked a whole lot more like uh, Anwar Sadat than they did like Winston Churchill. Because the Northern European, the white Northern Europeans, they didn't, didn't exist as a native people in the Middle East, in Africa or in, in Asia. They just didn't. There is, of course, also the view that uh, the so-called white or Caucasian race uh, were merely a genetic adaption to living in a Northern climate because vitamin A uh, and vitamin D and so on our vitamin D particularly, you need sunshine, and a, a darker skin uh, would block a lot of that. Whereas it was beneficial in, in equatorial lands or warmer lands, whereas in the far north, uh, the, the view is there, and it's valid uh, to a point, except except uh, a lot of them, as to this day, the very far northern people uh, are not uh, white, the so-called Eskimos, and they get their vitamin D from fish, from fish livers. You know, the old the news back in the had, had cod liver oil for people who had vitamin D deficiencies. Uh, that was, you know, it sort of counters the argument as well, keeping in mind that the original people, uh, everybody we know, whether it be the, the so-called science uh, view or the biblical view, we know they originated in that same area and spread out from there. And as such, uh, they were not white. I mean, I've actually heard one so far as to say that, that white people are genetic freaks simply because they are not the way man was created. I think as one of the people who believe in, in the idea that, that in evolution, that where there's no God, that the pr principle is the same. But it, it isn't necessarily so. But it could. I think the far northern climate has a, is a factor in that, uh, that us white folks aren't completely normal as far as, as it comes to uh, to the origin compared to the origin of man. And certainly Ephraim and Manasseh, very, very part of it, uh, a very big part of that. The irony, the, the one that I saw this week, the, the engagement of Prince Harry uh, to a woman who has, I think, one white parent and one black parent. Um, and she, you know, the people are criticizing that, the racists and all that. But the thing is, the irony of that, the paradox of that, if Ephraim and Massa, the, if the, the Anglo-Israelism theory is correct in that way, and I'm not saying it's not correct, but in a way that I think is based on the biblical scattering and the, and the gathering that's coming, but the irony is that someone of Ephraim or Manasseh, people argue about which is, which is which, but it doesn't matter, that he would marry someone who is of that, race, so-called race, quote-unquote, because that was the origin of Ephraim Manasseh to begin with, their mother. You know, the Egyptian woman who gave birth to Ephraim and Manasseh may have had pretty much the same skin color as the future bride of Prince Harry. I mean, the paradox is amazing. And God, you know, he, he rewards those who look to to uh, to those, to, to the biblical truth. He rewards these little chuckles, you know, that come along. Because it, that one I, you know, I, I found absolutely amazing. You know, it's just something that is biblically correct and working so well. I saw another one though that was quite outrageous. There was, I think, he was a um, a high-ranking member of the Anglican Church in England, Church of England, and he was praying, actually praying. He publicly made this statement yesterday or the day before. 
that Prince George uh, will find a nice boy to marry, and he would become the first uh, gay uh, king in his due time. And the and the Church of England's praying for that. Well, you know, where do they get their, their doctrine on that? You know, you read the Bible, and that's a very you know. But again, you know, as we said in our opening, there's no surprises anymore. And whatever it is, they want to tear it down. And it doesn't matter anyway, because one way or the other, as far as kings are concerned, royalty and so on, uh, God is our father. It's called the kingdom of God for a very good reason. King simply means father. It means the head of a kin. It was a, a used a, a pronoun, pronoun form, a plural yet singular, just the same as Elohim is, uh, without getting going on this because we're running short on time, but it's something, you know, the facts are there and there's not as big a wide, big wide space between uh, what science thinks and what the Bible says. It's just a matter of the attitude of do you believe in God or not? Verse 28, was returning and sitting in his chariot reading Isaiah the prophet. So here's this man from Ethiopia. Reading Isaiah. Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. And Philip ran thither to him, and heard him read the prophet of Isaiah, and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I, except some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. Well, no, there's a good answer there. You know, how do I know what it means unless somebody, some teacher teaches me? But the thing is, that in itself is proof that the Holy Spirit wasn't there yet. It's soon going to be, as we'll read, but it's not there yet. And that doesn't mean that somehow people don't have to read the Bible because, well, the Spirit just came upon me one day and now I know everything. I don't have to read the Bible. I've heard that one many times. And their errors are just amazing, the things that they come up with. Because all the, the actual Spirit that they have is their own self-righteousness. And again, you can't learn something of your own invention and call that Christianity. Or the the customer is always right uh, brand of Christianity. And it is a brand. It's like a business, a lot of them. Verse 32, the place of the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before a shearer, So opened he not his mouth. In his humiliation his judgment was taken away, and who shall declare his generation? For his life was taken from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this, of himself or of some other man? And that's a reasonable question. I mean, I'll put the link on for that study which covers that in detail. It's a reasonable question. It really is. I noticed he was reading Hebrew, but again, by the way, he was actually reading the scriptures. I don't think there were translations yet, but they could have been. And again, why the people, uh, the very famous Pentecost, you know, you might ask, well, how did he get to be uh, aware of all of that? Well, the people, that very famous birthday of the church, were from all those nations, there, including many African nations. And when they went home, they took with them the gospel in their own tongues, their own languages. And so, could that have been a translation there? Well, maybe, could have been maybe, but then Philip wouldn't have been able to read it either, I don't think. So, it is likely still Hebrew, but you can see the point. It doesn't require something to limit yourself to who someone else is in order for you to be yourself. as a matter of your salvation, because God is not a man. He created a particular language for a particular people because they were given the task of producing the line of the Messiah. But so it happens, it was their language. But they weren't hardly holy people. I mean, they blew it time after time after time after time. Naturally, and they failed, of all people. And they, of all people, had no excuse. Or at least the least excuse. Because they were given directly the word of God. And, you know, a lot of times, such as this man here from Ethiopia, he was far ahead of them than the people in Jerusalem who were still persecuting Christians. Verse 35, then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came to a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water, what doth hinder me 
What doth hinder me to be baptized? That was a fair question. And Philip obviously thought he was ready. And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, and thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded that the chariot stand still. And they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized them. Again, no sprinkling. Uh, the immersion, the meaning of that, the symbolic meaning of that death and resurrection of the old person. Uh, you don't just do that by uh, sprinkling. Maybe more convenient, but it's not genuine baptism. Verse 39, And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, and the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip was found at S. Sotus, and passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. Caesarea, is, of course, is on the, the Mediterranean Sea coast of Israel. But you can see that, and yet look at the very, very powerful uh, ministry that that he was having, that Philip was having, and he was one of the deacons. He was he was appointed a deacon at the same time as Stephen, and Stephen, I mean, look at the, what his final. He wasn't a, a preacher for very long, but he sure preached a one fine sermon. Got him killed uh, at that time, but it also got him alive. Because what he was seeing there, uh, not only with seeing the Lord at the right hand of God, but seeing the Lord from his conscious perspective, when that one damage that put him out his physical consciousness uh, did his horrendous work, uh, he went from that, from his conscious perspective to eternal life. You don't stay dead from your conscious perspective more than a blink. Even though Philip and all the rest of them, Stephen, all the rest of them, Paul himself, are all dead. But from their conscious perspective, they're there. Because death takes a blink. That's how long it takes. People worry, I said this before, people worry about their, their funeral arrangements and everything, which is fine. I mean, you don't take care of things, but from your own perspective, I mean, when you die, you're going to be awake again uh, from your conscious perspective long before uh, they can do anything with the physical body, which you don't need anymore anyway. That is not, if you're called first in the first resurrection, you're not going to need a physical body for a spiritual resurrection. And later on, as Paul plainly himself said, you know, the body that is sown is not the one that is, is and he was referring there specifically to the physical body, you know, as far as the elements are concerned, what composes our bodies over 70% water. You know, you could be, yesterday you could be part of a, a cloud up in the sky, the water, you know, it came down and people drink that. You know, it's possible. It's becomes your, yesterday you could have been a cloud, part of it, or part of a river, or in the elements, the protein and minerals and vitamins and everything from plants. It's, it's the ultimate God given, God created uh, recycling program up with the, Link on for the study of the biology of the resurrection, but it's it's something that again nothing is to be lost. The only one that can really make you dead, dead, dead as in forever dead is the Lord, and really the only one that can have that happen is one's own choice of refusing to repent when the time truly comes. And you know, just saying it's like saying you know if someone's going to be thrown into the lake of fire, for example, and people are as we read. Uh, you know, they could repent and say, Oh, I believe. I repent. I believe. And the Lord would have to forgive them, wouldn't he? Or would he? If they've already proven that it was just a lie or it was just a shallow, convenient fraud again. You know, but after years of, of doing the very same thing again, you just can't do it on the last day. It's something that's going to happen or require Time, some time. And again, I think it's, again, the reason why the last 42 months uh, is going to be so wild. I think the number of people, who new people who are going to be called is going to be very slight. There'll be some. I wouldn't completely say none, but it's not going to be the, the open possibility that it has been through the ages until, until then. Because again, character takes time. It takes time to grow something. 
and character it grows as much as anything else. What you sow, so shall you reap. Thank you for joining us for services this week. As always, your being with us makes our joy complete. Until next week when we meet again on this, God's Holy Sabbath Day, 2015.